Welcome everyone. My name is Mia Elfenbaum and I am a member of the Science of Early Child Development team at Red River College Polytechnic. As we begin, I would like to recognize that Red River College Polytechnic campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We are honored to have so many people from across Canada join us today. Please feel free to use the chat to tell us where you are from and share your own land acknowledgements. I am so excited to begin this webinar, which launches a new online workshop, Preventing Disruptive Behaviors in the Early Years. Today is also a celebration of the collaboration between the SECD team at Red River College Polytechnic and our wonderful colleagues at the Center of Excellence on Early Childhood Development. Together, we have planned a very interesting hour. We will start with a conversation between Richard Tremblay and Rob Santos, discussing disruptive behaviors research and lessons for the field of early learning and childcare. Following this conversation, Isabel Vinet and Jean Gervais will explain the history and the foundational work that led to the development of the new online workshop. Then Ellen Ibrahim will discuss how the SECD online workshops run and how to take advantage of those. All of this will be followed by an opportunity for you to ask questions. Rounding out the webinar team is Christelle Lemartre from the Center of Excellence on Early Childhood Development. I will now turn things over to Isabel Vinay to introduce today's topic conversation. Isabel is an expert in the prevention of disruptive behaviors in the early years and executive director at the Center of Excellence on Early Childhood Development. Isabel? Uh, we are excited to share today with you what is, a, well, indeed, a, a re, the result of a long-standing collaborative effort between the Science of ECD team and ourselves. And this partnership really started 20 years ago and is still pretty much alive. So uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rob Santos. Uh, there would be so much to say, but only to name a few things. Um, uh, Rob Santos, uh, really, uh, after two decades of service as a public servant for the government of Manitoba, he acted as an assistant deputy minister of the Healthy Child Manitoba office and also assistant Dep uh, deputy minister for the K-12 education in Manitoba. He, now he, he is now, I'm sorry, the research chair uh, for the School of Health Sciences and Community Services at Red River College Polytechnic. Welcome, Rob. I'm so happy that you're here mm -hmm. today. Thank you. Merci, Isabel, um, and good day to everybody joining us today. Um, well, it's a pleasure. It's a little bit of a mini reunion for me. I, I joined the college about 14 months ago, uh, as, as Isabel mentioned, but have worked with the, the wonderful team there, uh, including on the science of ECD for a long time. Um, I'm also pleased to reunite with, uh, with Richard, and I'll introduce him right now. Um, I, he feels like one of those people who needs no introduction, and so uh, there's more information in the biography. Uh, he's an emeritus professor of psychology at the University of Montreal and the University College of Dublin, um, as well as con the continuing uh, co-director of the Center for Excellence for Early Child Development. Um, so, Richard, uh, our job in this uh, segment is to have a conversation to talk about why this topic of this workshop is so important. But I wanted to share um, just some personal thoughts for people that uh, may not have met you or heard you speak or know your work. Um, uh, as Isabel mentioned, I was lucky enough to, to meet uh, Richard a little over two decades ago. Uh, if you know the field, you'll know he's one of the living legends in this area of work. Um, I think at some point he, he's exceeded 500 articles and, and publications in this this area of the origins of uh, human aggression. Um, I think it was five years ago, Richard, was it, where you won the Stockholm Prize, in, which is really considered the Nobel Prize in criminology, which uh, is, is quite stunning. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to work with Richard and the CEECD team over the years in terms of uh, combining and synthesizing the best knowledge on early child development, ECD, and then sharing it widely, including to audiences like we have today, who 
uh, can make the most of that knowledge uh, in, in their work, in their direct uh, uh, work with uh, young children. Uh, so Richard, I, I thought I'd start by inviting you to share your own origin story, because uh, some people may not know that you actually did not begin your career uh, in early childhood. So did you want to sh share a bit of uh, in the beginning? Yes, yes, I can do that. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, you are all working in an area that is uh, extremely important. Um, I started my career after having played hockey and football. I, I did a, an undergraduate degree in physical education. And I guess my real hope was to become a professional hockey player and football. <laughs> and while I was planning to do that, I studied in physical education and eventually ended up in working as a physical education teacher in a mental hospital. Um, and um, <clears throat> the mental hospital in question was a high security mental hospital uh, because most of the people who were there had killed someone. So it was a hospital for mentally ill offenders. Um, and as I worked with uh, these people uh, doing different activities and a lot of uh, physical education activities, I eventually decided um, that uh, I should try to see if we could do prevention work and prevent individuals for, from going into these institutions. Um, <clears throat> and so I work with juvenile delinquents and that's where I met Jean Gervais he was not one of the juvenile delinquents, but he was, uh, like me, one of the students where we were training um, uh, to become educators for um, juvenile delinquents. Uh, Jean uh, got the answer much more quickly than me. Uh, after one year with juvenile delinquents, he went to work with uh, children uh, elementary school age children. Um, <clears throat> uh, but I, um, I decided to, to do a, an assessment of the impact of juvenile delinquent uh, institutions and showed, like many others before me, um, that uh, putting a bunch of uh, adolescent delinquents together in the residential institution was not the best way uh, to prevent them from further problems. Uh, in, in fact, in many cases, it increases the problems. So uh, having done that type of research, I decided to start a longitudinal study. Um, <clears throat> after having uh, had a uh, position at the University of Montreal, um, I decided to um, study the development of kindergarten children uh, from poor areas in Montreal. And so we've we followed uh, a thousand boys and within this group of boys that we followed from kindergarten, uh, they're now in their 40s. Uh, we showed that the kindergarten boys who had behavior problems were most at risk of having all the problems uh, that we can imagine during adolescence and adulthood. Um, so that study 
um, led to a study where we decided to do a preventive intervention with high risk uh, kindergarten boys. And we showed that a heavy investment into parent training at home, um, support to teachers and social skills training with uh, the boys, including the aggressive boys within a group of boys who did not have problems of aggression. We showed that in the long run, they succeeded much better in school. They, um, they were much less involved in delinquent behavior. Much less of them went to prison. And recently, uh, we've shown uh, that what they are earning, the, the amount of income tax they're paying is much more than those who did not receive this preventive intervention. Um, so all that work was showing uh, that it's important to start early. And we had started in kindergarten. Uh, and finally, um, the idea came up that what would happen if we would start much earlier? Um, and so we started with a random sample of children in the province of Quebec that we've been following uh, from essentially from birth. Um, and the, I guess the major surprise that I got in my career was looking at the development of physical aggressions from age two to age 18. And we, when we do that with thousands of children, what we see is that we are at our peak in terms of aggressive behavior between age two and three. So the, the idea of the terrible twos is a real reality. Uh, humans uh, do not learn to aggress over time. Humans are ready for fighting to survive uh, very early in life as, as soon as we can coordinate our uh, muscles. Um, and so it's very clear that the best time to intervene, to start interventions, to help the children that are at high risk of having behavior problems is in early childhood. Yeah. And well, and Richard, can you, yeah. can you dig in a bit more because the, you know, the, the search to understand the origins of crime and violence and human aggression is probably as old as the as humanity itself. Uh, and of course, over the centuries, there's been this debate about nature versus nurture. And so can you say a little bit more about what and that graph that Christelle just put on screen about the peak of human aggression being <laughs> when we're toddlers? Um, what did that teach us about the nature versus nurture? Uh, story and in, in aggression. Yes, well, um, that's a, an important question. Um, all the children that we had followed, the thousands of children that we followed from early childhood to adulthood um, were important, but we, they were singletons. Um, and we at one point decided to answer Rob's question that we needed twins. We needed twin, you know, th there are two types of twins. There are twins where each individual uh, have the same genes. And there are twins that are siblings. They are 
they share only half of their genes like uh, normal siblings. So we've been following a few thousand pairs of twins uh, since early childhood. And I mean, they behave like other twins, like other children, uh, but having twins that were identical and twins that are fraternal, that is, they are like uh, two brothers who would not have been born at the same time. We showed that there was a very strong genetic part to the story. Um, there, there are clearly genetic effects on um, aggressive behavior. And we can see that by age two. The twins that are identical are much more similar in terms of behavior than the, twi the twins that are fraternal. Um, so that's one part of the importance of the genetic heritage that we get. The other part is what we call the impact of the environment on our genes, on the expression of our genes. And so this is this area of research is very new. We, we started doing this uh, only 20 years ago. And um, the, uh, the idea that was first tested with animals, and in fact, it was tested uh, with rats here in Montreal uh, by two investigators that were part of the same committee that Rob and I were part 20 years ago, uh, the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research. And that, um, that research uh, that had been done with, uh, with rats, uh, we sort of did it with humans and, and with monkeys. And what we showed is that the environment has an impact on the expression of our genes. Uh, and um, if we are in a good environment, um, the genes that will be turned on and the genes that will be turned off will be the genes that help us adapt to our environment. Um, but in some cases, the environment um, starts initiates genes that are inadequate in terms of our adjustment. Um, so today we are going to talk, uh, and during this course, we are going to talk about um, the importance of the environment, the social environment, and the family environment. But we must also remember that there is a prenatal environment, and there are events during the prenatal environment and also after birth that trigger genes that will shut some genes and will activate other genes, um, and these will have an impact on our ability to learn and to learn to control our behavior. And so children who are unfortunate to um, um, be brought up in a disorganized environment and children whose mothers, for example, smoked during pregnancy were highly stressed, will be very different children, um, <clears throat> not because of the genes in themselves at the origin, but to the extent that they've been triggered or not triggered. And so some of the, these children will have much more difficulty in uh, adapting to their environment. Um, so 
we we are talking when we're talking about behavior problems we are talking about problems that are very complex in terms of their origins and in terms of their development but we know that the environment can help in preventing a lot of the problems uh, that we want to solve and from that perspective um, <clears throat> interventions in the prenatal period and interventions in early childhood are most certainly the most important to prevent most of the problems that we hear uh, on the radio in the on the television and in the newspapers uh, every day. We hear about all of these problems and every day I say to myself, my God, why don't they invest more in uh, prenatal interventions and in early childhood education? If we would do that, we would hear much less on the radio, television and different media about all uh, the problem uh, that we care about. So essentially that's, uh, that's the story of my life. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful life for sure, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna pass it now over to Isabel because that's a perfect segue. Uh, now understanding how important that time in life is for the topic of this workshop, Isabel. Yeah, well, thank you, Rob and Risa. Those, uh, those uh, valuable insights are so important. That's great. Thank you. So I'm now happy to welcome uh, Professor Jean Gervais. And I must say, I had the chance to have Richard as my professor when I was studying uh, 30 years ago. So it's, uh, it's uh, enlightening and also a, a longtime collaborator, Jean. So uh, Jean is an associate professor at the Department of Psychoeducation and the psychology at the University uh, du Québec en Outaouais. Uh, his current activities focus on the dissemination of uh, scientific information and uh, the support for, of parents and youth, and also training of professionals working with young children. So he's a long, long time collaborator of the Center of Excellence, and he led the development of the initial training resources that we mostly used uh, for the creation of the new online uh, workshop. He provided uh, guidance through all uh, those many years of adaptation that we went through for uh, the online uh, workshop. And I want to thank him uh, personally for all the time he invested in this and uh, his insight. And of course, uh, I'm, well, I'm so grateful that, you know, Rob and Richard and Jean, you know, you're there and you really are there to make a difference for children. So it's important. So, bonjour, Jean. <laughs> bonjour, Isabelle. <clears throat> um, Jean, along with Richard, um, and as Richard mentioned, you're our longtime friends, right? You you met Absolutely. in the yeah. early 20s. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess. We can and, say uh, so, 50 years. Um, so I guess uh, you had a lot of conversation together over the years about prevention and what should we do. Yeah, and we, we do have now a lot of conversation too. We're always yeah. in contact and working <laughs> with, on something. And uh, I know you still are developing some ideas, so that is yeah, so great. Yeah, well, yeah, we like <laughs> but, that. Uh, you know? It uh, prevents you get old, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we stay Richard. young with that, I guess. That's the idea. Mm. <laughs> so, so happy to, that you share your wisdom. So uh, 15 years ago, you had that idea with Richard uh, to create some knowledge uh, dissemination, dissemination tools about those findings, about the, the longitudinal, longitudinal studies. I always struggle with that uh, name. So the findings, the important findings about prevention uh, of disruptive behavior. So you went through uh, the development of different tools. So we're going to look at some of uh, those today. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and when I ask you, really why why did you at some point in 2005 uh, decided to say well you know the information is there the articles are there well, well why did you decided to work on different uh, knowledge tools uh, you two together and the answer you gave me at that point was to raise awareness mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you said it's there you know the studies are there we know but 
we are surprised that there is no, that, you know, the message around prevention. And yes, that there is high levels of high frequency of uh, disruptive behaviors during the early years. So um, I guess your answer about, you know, an awareness that this is not really, development yeah. is a problem, right? An awareness that lead, for example, to medication, to exclusion. I mean, it's, it's terrible to consider that some children, the more difficult children with disruptive behaviors uh, can be excluded from the milieu, they would be helped. I mean, they need that uh, uh, particularly, uh, particularly more the, the milieu uh, with people that can help them, with adults that can help them. And and non, there's a, I'm the, for example, I, I'm the, the grandfather of 10, grandchild and uh, I have twins now four years old there's one which is very difficult but I mean I know he has a lot of disruptive behavior and I think it's very normal at two three four years old too so you have to know you have to get some scientific information that that we knows about child development and how normal those behaviors are and how the role of environment is so important uh, Richard has uh, highlighted this point and it's it's uh, environment makes a difference to help children who have uh, socialization problems disruptive behaviors so that's why i mean uh, we had to do those documentary film and that dvd to help the training to help parents and to help all professionals that deal with children i mean we have to have we have to inform them because they don't have that much time to read um, more of the time they're, you know, after their day of work, they're uh, very tired, so you know, they won't take a book. I mean, it's more easier to, to look to a documentary that sort of synthesize all the important information we know about child development, disruptive behaviors, yeah. So you are dedicated to make sure that the good information and those key Absolutely. messages we know uh, yeah. um, gets yeah. out there, right? That Absolutely. they are heard. Uh, yeah. I've been doing that for <laughs> so 30, that, 40 years now. Yeah. Yeah. It's so part of the normal development, but you know, there's a peak around mm -hmm. three. Wait, that's it. Yeah. That. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That also that we need to really, and uh, and I know, and you know, you've been training, you know, uh, we, um, and offering a lot of training for uh, teachers and the early uh, childhood educators. And, you know, mm -hmm. we see that when we work in that field, we know that this is there, but we struggle against some maybe point of views from others saying, well, do you really, are you really exhausted working with those small ones, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so we can track yeah. with, uh, and we know that this is there and we know that it is important, but we also know to make sure that others know <laughs> that, really? you know, there's so much we can do and so much we can support in terms of mm -hmm. before the age of five. So I guess, um, Yes, well, I thank you for uh, <laughs> working on those well, tools because I've been using some of those. So in terms of uh, those tools and what you have created and what are those training tools that, you know, really led to the, con the creation of the uh, workshop, um, the online workshop, there was one mm -hmm. first thing that you did in 2005. I remember yeah, it was yeah. yesterday, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, was, that's it, uh, yeah. And the first yeah, thing yeah, was yeah. the documentary of the origins of human aggression in 2005, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. distributed still by the National Film, uh, Film Board. It's a 60 yeah. minute things. And I remember for a fact, I was uh, training and providing training at that uh, point in time. And when the docu documentary uh, got out, it yeah. was some kind of a shock, right? Right, <laughs> Because yeah. uh, you made a choice uh, to really make it, um, a point that, you know, it's there, aggression in young children is there. And you know, I you know you use some pictures, uh, you know, of young children being violent, violent, and uh, I know it created some. Oh, is it really? Can we really talk about aggression at this? Uh, yeah, at this that's age? a big um, question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a there was a lot of material from the original documentary. Absolutely, and and thanks to SCCD that we're able now to use all the uh, images we've been you know catching through um, uh, all the filming and the uh, uh, child care uh, to get to the, to concretize this, this project of having a documentary film. Uh, yeah, but, so and thank you, you yourself with Kishar, you went a step further from that footage you really created and you wanted to create a training. Yeah, yeah, after that we create that DVD 
uh, which has like the direct observation, scientific information, uh, and also learning activities. We went a little further because we had integrated activities, learning activities. So, uh, yeah. but still, uh, you know, people were working individually, and I think I'll be I'll be maybe uh, talking about it a, a little later. Now we have the opportunity, so people can interact in the courses. Uh, we we we're putting in line today. They can interact with the content and sharing their experience, ex preoccupations. That's a, that's a, a important learning source that we, yes. we didn't have by the past. You know, people would look at it. Um, and I must say, Jean, I use the, those training materials and it's great. And yes, it's there in the new workshop now, but uh, I must say that, you know, our computers, they don't have any DVD. Uh, <laughs> Technically, yeah. Also, and, uh, yeah. and one thing you did also with Richard was the, you wrote a report about, uh, you know, those early learning uh, that we need to and make yeah, sure that children yeah, you know, yeah. prevent youth violence. So it's, uh, we, if people, if you're uh, interested, the whole report is on the Encyclopedia website. Mm -hmm. And uh, this material also, uh, um, you can find some of those information in uh, the online uh, course. And uh, mm -hmm. with the Encyclopedia, there is also some of the information uh, from the expert articles, but also uh, information sheets for parents and um, and practitioners that uh, were used in the creation mm -hmm. of the workshop. And um, lastly, but not the least, uh, we used also um, information from uh, the Science of ECD platform for the new course. So footage, uh, readings, learning material. And I must say, I have learned so much working with uh, your team, uh, Mia um, and Eileen and Rob, you know, making sure that, you know, we, we create exer uh, exercises that are meaningful. Uh, we put a lot of videos. Um, so I think you bring knowledge uh, transfer mobilization a step further. And I wanna thank you uh, for that. So Jean, uh, if for my last question for you, um, you know, with all that material being there, why uh, do you find in a, a few words uh, is it important to have that workshop now? Yeah, well, well, I, I think I've, I've, I've uh, said it before, but it, it's an opportunity. It's a new opportunity to to use important scientific materials and in a new way, so people can share all the information, can discuss. Uh, uh, because it's uh, it's important for the people that work with children, with parents. I mean, sharing between parents information is a key, and it's it's, it's a key also for childcare workers or any people that work with difficult children. I've been doing that uh, um, in the past, and I've been uh, doing some training. I, I know it's so it gives us the opportunity of that. So so it's it's um, very very. Uh, I very appreciate it. Um, like I said, helping uh, just helping uh, the young ones to share toys, control big emotions like anger, uh, fear, uh, control their behaviors. It requires a lot of creativity and a lot of passions. And you know, sharing uh, how you how do you do that uh, it is very very and interesting, uh, very informative. Uh, so. I mean, the only thing I would say is to thanks again to see SACD to, uh, I think that to permit that uh, we share this information for parents, for childcare workers, any field, any any professional actually that deals with with difficult children. Uh, so that that's how I would. That's yeah, how well, I would say. thank you so much. <laughs> okay, no, always uh, enjoy working thanks. with. Thanks to and, you uh, because we've been working with Richard, Isabel, Cristal. Uh, thanks to Mia, we've you know, been working hard on this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm so glad today we're you know. Uh, yeah, we're you know, celebrating this. Celebrating and, uh, this, right? Absolutely. If I may, I will uh, now let the uh, Ellen uh, from the Science Visit to to show us you know the workshop what it's all about. So thank you, Jean. Okay. Well, and, and, and thank you, Isabel and Jean, for such a fascinating and informative discussion. I'm sure you've generated a lot of interest in this very important topic. So all of you listening are likely eager to learn more and hopefully wondering how you can share this information with, um, with your members, with your clients, or your staff. 
So some of you are familiar with the SECD online professional development workshops that we offer. If so, you'll know that in these workshops, participants access multimedia content. They view videos of children. They listen to interviews with experts. They do short readings and play fun review games. They're guided by a facilitator and meet, and meet other participants in online discussion groups. Uh, all of you on, on the call today will be given access to the Disruptive Behavior Workshop so that you can have a closer look at the content of that particular workshop. You'll see that the Disruptive Behavior Workshop is organized into three weeks with one or two topic pages each week. This sample page starts with an introduction to the topic, and you can see includes some key information to read, as well as, well as a short clip of an interview with Richard Tremblay. Each page moves from the introduction to a what do you see section, which allows participants to visualize the concepts by watching videos of children. Many of the videos come from the original aggression DVDs that you heard about a few minutes ago, uh, there are also clips from uh, various SECD resources, including footage of early years programs in several countries. The what do we know sections present research findings related to the topic. This might be web text, a link to a reading, or an interview with an expert. Each topic page concludes with what can be done as participants start to learn strategies to prevent and handle disruptive behaviors. Throughout the pages, interactive review games like the one here provide opportunities to reflect on the material and test one's learning. These include matching games, quizzes, and drag and drop exercises. Throughout, participants are encouraged to consider what they're viewing and reading as they're prompted with reflection questions. Many of the reflect questions are also used in the weekly discussions so participants can learn from each other. All of our workshops have a similar format. During a two to three week period, participants can choose when and where they work through the content and complete the weekly tasks. The Disruptive Behaviors Workshop will be our eighth workshop. workshop. Um, as you can see from the list here, we currently have workshops on topics such as play, reflective practice, and the importance of brain development. These workshops have typically been offered in partnership with an, EC, an early childhood professional association. The association advertises to their members, manages registration, and issues PD credit when completed. We essentially provide everything else, the content, setup, and the facilitator who guides participants and tracks participation. Uh, the Disruptive Behavior Workshop is, is considered an intermediate work, workshop and runs over three weeks. Participants are able to receive 12 PD credits uh, upon completion. Uh, the cost to each participant is $150, which is shared between the partner organization, the Center of Excellence, and Red River. Another possible way that we've offered work workshops that might be more suited to some of you on the call is that government or an agency can arrange for a, a workshop for a cohort of people. So this could be for their staff or for clients or members of their organization. The organization would then pay a lump sum for the cohort uh, and then would offer it free to those participants. Uh, this model could also in involve some minor customization. So for instance, although um, this workshop is geared to people working in early childhood settings, if there was interest in offering it to home visitors, we could adapt some examples or the discussion questions to better suit that audience. For those of you from professional associations that have offered the workshops in the past, you'll see that the Disruptive Behaviors Workshop has been added to the list. So if you're interested, you can work with, with Angie and with myself to arrange for dates to offer this new workshop in the same way that you've, you've offered other SECD workshops in the past. Uh, but we're also anxious to explore other ways that this workshop can be offered across Canada to early childhood educa educators, to family child care providers, home visitors, and you know, others working with children and families. We hope many of you have ideas about how this workshop might, might benefit your members or your clients or your staff. Um, so I look forward to connecting with you individually to explore, explore those possibilities. So please feel free to you know, follow up with any questions you might have about adaptations or customization. 
I also want to let you know that this workshop will be translated into French and available early in the new year. And we uh, will plan a similar launch at that time. I'll now turn it uh, over to Christelle who will facilitate a question and answer period. So thank you, thank you, Ellen and everyone for uh, an informative uh, presentation and I hope uh, all of you enjoy. Um, so, so we're now uh, at uh, nearly at the end of, of this presentation and uh, we will uh, open the floor for questions uh, from the audience. Okay. Uh, Rob, please, you, you can unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, as people are uh, you know, formulating their questions for our distinguished uh, guests, um, I wanted to follow up, Richard, on what you, what you described about the epigenetic story. And so uh, what's so powerful to us about that new research, and it's funny when you say it's relatively new, it's only 20 years. <laughs> it's just a, a long time. Um, a big message of that story is that our genes aren't necessarily our destiny, that in fact, how we shape the worlds we live in, the environments that children grow up in, and especially during early childhood, uh, make a huge difference. Another uh, finding in that research that, that you and Jean talk a lot about are these intergenerational effects, that this crosses generations. and. Um, I'd love to hear both of you talk a bit more about that, because I think the people in our audience already know, and I hope they do, how important the work they and the people they work with is uh, for those specific children and families. But there's also this long impact uh, that you found in some of your own research about the children of the children over time. Uh, and I'd love to, if you could share more about that story with the audience. Uh, <clears throat> yes. The, um, uh, I think the intergenerational um, part of the story is um, one of the most fascinating and um, to a certain extent, it, um, it, it, it's a pathway to solving problems, but it's also a realizing that there are pathways that some individuals are unfortunate to be on. And we can, I guess one of the issues is what we call assortative mating. Um, if there's all many, many different aspects to assortative mating. Um, let's take uh, some of the simpler. Uh, you, you've probably realized that um, um, <clears throat> most couples uh, uh, of mothers and fathers, uh, for example, uh, the father is taller than the mother. Um, the, height is an incredibly important part of assortative mating. It's, it's very rare that you, you see couples uh, where the, uh, the mother is taller than the father. Um, so that, that's a sort of a simple law of nature that appears to have been written a long, long time ago <laughs> and that keeps on repeating itself. Now, the, the other part of the assortative mating, uh, and there are a number of them, uh, which creates problems is, for example, me mental illness. Uh, there's a very nice study that's been done in Sweden where they they have all this information on the whole population. And they've shown that um, if someone has a mental health problem, the risk, the likelihood that this person who has a mental health problem will form a couple with someone else who has a mental health problem is very high. Um, 
and I mean, we, we can go on and on in thinking about the different uh, aspects of assortative mating. Um, we assortative mate on social class, on height, on um, interest, on mental health problems. So um, it's, it's very clear that in terms of the investment that we make um, for our interventions, we need to take into account uh, these, these laws of nature. Um, and, and so it's, it's very clear that some couples need support, they need help from the moment they become a couple. Um, and that these intervention um, are likely to change not only the life of the couple, but the life of, of their children. And so I, I've, um, when I listen to what the problems that are discussed about uh, health and about mental health, about schooling, uh, about success or not success in school, about the uh, uh, individual, we, we heard, we we're hearing in Montreal regularly now that there are uh, people that are shooting each other uh, in the streets. Um, these, th these different problems originate it, over time, and they are not things that you can solve very quickly. Um, and I think that we need to keep in our mind uh, that the earlier we intervene, if we're thinking about children, the earlier the intervention, the better. And all the professionals that are interacting with people who have difficulties need to understand that what they are seeing started a long time ago and will have will have effects for a very long time. And that's why it's very important to start to invest in our interventions as, as much as possible, as early as possible. And if we can convince our, uh, the people responsible for the organizations we work with and uh, up to uh, the deputies and the ministers and the organization, we need to deliver that message that where we should invest most is early. And unfortunately, if you look at the budgets of all the provinces, the investments are always later. <laughs> Once it becomes a big problem, then we try to put a lot of money and it's rever the reverse that must be done. And I mean, one of the best examples I have, which is linked to today and what happened uh, with the COVID uh, issue is that those who are suffering most from it are the older people. Um, but the older generation, the baby boomers that I am part of, um, we, if we continue to invest a lot of money in the baby boomers without investing in our children, in our grandchildren, we will have much more problems in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it's not a good, the, investing early is a good investment. Investing late is not a very good investment. And, and so we need to bring that message constantly to uh, our governments, to, to our institutions. 
early intervention is very important. Well, thanks, Richard. John, did you want to add to that before we move to wrapping up? Uh, you're on mute. Okay. There we are. Are we okay? Okay. Now, what I would add to this internet intergenerational question or per the perpetration of, of family problem from one generation to another is that uh, we know now, we know the parents that need helps in the community. And we know that children then in every community, uh, family that has poverty, low education, isolation, we got to help them because, you know, we, we uh, the problem will perpetuate. Uh, so we, we have to give them more attention, more services. We have to help boys, but we have to pay particular attention to girls that will eventually have babies. You have, if we, we have to stop that. And uh, we have a lot of scientific, scientific information that give us very specific information about what families and what children do, uh, do need that help, uh, particular help. That, that's, what I, that's what I would add to uh, my friend uh, Shara uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you. Well, merci beaucoup to both of you. Um, time, where did it go? Um, uh, so we will now uh, do a bit of a wrap up and a conclusion. Um, oh, that's me. Well, I just wanna thank all of you uh, who joined us today from across the country, uh, our beautiful teams from uh, CEECD and SECD in bringing this all together. Uh, the remarkable and continuing careers of our, our distinguished uh, professors and Richard and Jean. Um, your expertise and experience just really invaluable. And John, so glad you you brought Richard's um, big messages to uh, governments back to the community, back to the places where all the people who have joined us today are really making a difference. And I think they know now even more strongly how important and far reaching their work can be. And that we really do have this knowledge, you know, decades, half a century of knowledge about this now. Uh, putting it into the right hands. So thank you all so much. So as Ellen mentioned, um, you'll all be getting an email tomorrow with your exclusive access. Uh, she'll follow up with you on details as needed. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you know how to find us. <laughs> and then of course, um, we encourage you to have continue these conversations because uh, I don't need to persuade anybody on this call, but this is probably the most important conversation to be having about our, our future as a country, as, as, a, as a society, and as the world, such as it is right now. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, have a great day, and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care, everybody.